to anyone that actually believes the moon landing happened and NASA went to the moon, I got some questions for you. First question, do you guys actually believe this piece of junk, plastic looking thing landed on the moon? Let's take a closer look at the moon lander. This thing seriously looks like it's made out of paper mache and f***ing cardboard. Really? If I would have made this for a project in high school, I would have failed. Second question. Who was Neil Armstrong's camera man? Who was taking the picture and videoing everything? Also, Neil Armstrong's boots don't match the footprints that were found on the moon. How do you explain that? And I have just one more question, and then I am done, I promise. Do you remember the moon buggy that was brought to the moon in this moon landing vehicle? The go-kart they made to drive around the moon. How did it get there? If this is what they say landed on the moon, where did they put it? How did the moon buggy fit in this thing? How? Now, I'm not saying they did or didn't land on the moon. Yeah, no, that didn't happen. This is going to be interesting. Remember, it's called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. The North Pole is another thing that is surrounded in a lot of mystery. And if you look at maps today, you'll see that there's nothing there. It's just a wasteland and that no one would ever want to go there, obviously, because it's way too cold. It's just ice but you get pictures of these people who supposedly are at the North Pole and they literally have a little flag right there in the ground and we're supposed to believe that that is the North Pole. Now, if you are of a critical thinking mind, doesn't this all look just a little weird? You know, they got all these photo ops and we're just supposed to believe them that this is the actual North Pole. So we know that all compasses point to the North. We know that there is a magnetic North. And so we're supposed to believe that all the compasses are pointing to this little flag that they have there. And you could get into the magnetic north and true north i don't i don't care about all that either way there's nothing there according to what we're fed today but what if there is something there there's an old map called the mercator map and you can see in this map that there is a big mountain right in the center this mountain is said to be called rupus nigra which means black rock and it's at the center of all things it's at the center of the world which would be the north pole and it's a magnetic mountain which would make complete sense as to why all the compasses are drawn to the north what's interesting as well is on this old mercator map there are four islands around this rock this north pole in today's maps, all those have been completely erased. And there's also four rivers flowing out. And in the midst of these four islands and four rivers was said to be a whirlpool. And that water rushes round about and descends into the earth. Just as if one was pouring it through a filter funnel. And this would also explain why we have tides. In the book of Genesis, it talks about four rivers running out from the Garden of Eden. And in Genesis, the first river is called Pison. The second river is called Gihon. The third river is Hiddekel. And the fourth is the river Euphrates. Could it be that these geographical locations aren't really where we think that they are? It's very much possible. Would it make sense that Eden was at the center of the earth? And when Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden, the Lord placed cherubims and flaming swords to guard it. And the Bible also says that Mount Zion is on the sides of the north. 
and that's the city of the great king. What they are telling us is the North Pole. I don't believe for a second it was really shocking for me at first when I entered into the flat earth debate to find that the most ignorant, arrogant, stupid, mean people who did not have a grasp on science were on the globe earth side. As I have to say over and over and over again, I have not chosen whether the earth is a sphere or a flat plane. I'm just asking questions, relevant, reasonable questions about the inconsistencies of our cosmological model. And what happens? We get a bunch of globe earthers to come in and say, tell me you don't understand science without telling me you don't understand science. Wow, someone was homeschooled. And any other just mean, nasty thing they could say to you without ever backing up their science, without ever explaining their position, without ever giving a good argument against the data that you're giving them or the theory that you've postulated. They'll sit here and pretend they understand science by just saying the word science but they never actually talk about science. By the way, I don't have a PhD in science, but let me tell you a little bit about my journey with science. In high school, when I graduated with a Regents Diploma, I got all four of my sequences in math and science. That means I did all the math and science in high school and then took all of the AP classes. Then I was a biology major in college and I got bored. And then I was a physics major in college and I got bored. Because most of the math and science they're teaching you in college is absolute garbage, right? It's under that glass ceiling because they figured out way more stuff and they stopped telling the public. Anyways, I got a more interesting degree along the lines of performance, art, radio, theater, video production, communication, public speaking, etc., etc. And then I continued my study of science on my own. The biggest difference I find over and over again between the flat earthers and the globe earthers is one, the flat earthers are decent human beings who are respectful to other human beings despite whatever beliefs they have. And the flat earthers simply ask really good questions that everyone else is afraid to ask. They're open-minded and they're polite in debate. The globe earthers, look at my comments. You don't have to believe me. Look at all my flat earth videos. Look how the globe earthers talk to the flat earthers and look how the flat earthers talk to the globe earthers. Now it's not always the case, right? You have some flat earth people that are kind of jerks and I tell them that, but you will see a majority of the time it's the globe earther disrespecting the flat earther. Now, if you're confident in your science, in your belief, and you're a decent human being, you're not going to be mean to people because they don't understand something. You're just going to talk to them. You're just going to educate them. You say, well, actually, this is how it works. And these are the processes and we can test them in this way. Then we'd start to believe you, but you're making yourselves look really like on the wrong side because you never back up any of your stuff with real scientific defenses. You're just mean, you just name call. That sounds like the bully who's not understanding what's going on in class and he makes a ruckus to distract everyone. Let's see if we can fit all the inconsistencies of the globe earth model and narrative into one video. And just so everyone knows, I'm not a globe earther or a flat earther. I have no idea what the shape of the earth is. Before we get started on this long list, I'd like to remind everyone it's really important for us to ask questions. It's the lack of asking questions by the Commonwealth that has got us into the situation that a bunch of people think they can lie to us all the time about everything. And because I already know what kind of responses and comments we're going to get on this video, I'd like to remind everybody, if you have the answer to a question, if you're informed and a decent human being, if somebody asks a question about Flat Earth, you should be able to just answer the question with your science and your logic and not insult the person's intelligence and walk away. Understand that just makes you look like a person who's pretending they know what's going on. And just understand that anybody who thinks they're on the side of science by being an arrogant jerk about it, just remember that Carl Sagan and Richard Feynman would be absolutely ashamed of you. So let's start with the inconsistencies that brought me into the debate the first time. And that is that NASA lies. It's not a debate. It's not speculation. NASA is lying to us all the time. People talk about the space station, how that's proof that we live on a globe Earth. But how many times have those astronauts been hung up on strings to make it look like they're floating in the space station? Does it mean the space station's not real? Not necessarily. But is it weird that they're faking that they're floating in space? Absolutely. And they're lying to us. So how many more things are they lying about? Next, how is it possible that the mathematically calculated weight of the Earth is 6.6 .6 sextillion tons? 
the Earth is going 66,600 miles around the sun, and it is on a 23.4 degree tilt. And off the other side of the 90 degree angle, that's 66.6 degrees. It is a very, very strange and astronomically improbable coincidence that all three of those measurements have 666 in the beginning. But if you were creating a false narrative based on the biblical revelations, you would do that and give a little wink to the few people who could see past the details. Up next is the rainbow. Understand that the rainbow is a projection from a prism. This nonsense about rainbows being shaped like that because of the shape of raindrops is absolutely ridiculous. The rain is not the prism. The rain is the screen. And even if the rainbow was being projected through the rain, it wouldn't be shaped like each individual raindrop. It doesn't make any sense. It'd be shaped like the entire prism of the sheets of rain. And since all sheets of rain take on different shapes, it's impossible that the rainbow is being created by the rain. The real answer is the rainbow is always there. We just can't see it until the rain comes down and creates a visible sheet. It's like projecting a hologram. You need some sort of medium for the hologram to hit so that you can see it. The rainbow is shaped like a bow or a circle, depending on who you talk to, because it's being projected from a convex prism. The light is bouncing off of some solid medium way up there that is shaped like a convex, which is basically the only way that you could consistently reproduce that rainbow shape over and over again all the time. What's next? The fact that people aren't allowed to go to Antarctica. Why wouldn't people be allowed to go to Antarctica? You can climb Everest, that's dangerous. But there are no people zones and no fly zones all over Antarctica. Why? Then there are those flight patterns where you have to do crazy different detours on planes in order to avoid the South Pole. And then there's Admiral Byrd's testimony, a credible military officer, who said that when you fly past Antarctica, you get to new land, fresh water, green grass, and trees. And I know what a lot of you are thinking, well, this doesn't prove that the globe doesn't exist, that the sphere doesn't exist. No, but it proves that they're lying to us about a bunch of things that would appear to be hiding a different shape or different sized Earth. It seems like they're trying really hard to convince us of their cosmology, and they are constantly getting caught in lies. That's not speculation. They have lied so many times. And how about the satellites? Well, if satellites can go into orbit and spin around the Earth, then why are so many of them attached to balloons and brought to the upper atmosphere? The issue again here is that when we ask these types of questions, we don't get good answers. I have never had anybody tell me why some satellites are on balloons and some satellites they put out into orbit. You'd think if you could get a satellite into orbit and it stays up there for a really long time, why would you do all the logistical pains and extra equipment to put a satellite on a balloon and float it across the sky, have it land, and put it back up? And you'll still have people say that those satellites don't exist with the balloons on them. Except we saw one fly over Montana last year. And now we have pictures and videos of them launching these satellites attached to balloons at some really cold place. Probably Antarctica. Probably one of the reasons we're not allowed to go there. So we know these types of satellites exist. But we have to ask ourselves, why do they exist? If we can just put them all up. I mean, Elon's launching satellites all the time. It's not like they don't have enough... Uh, technology and means to get them all up there no i mean they have tons of rockets sending them up all the time so why are we using balloon powered satellites you know and then there's tons of videos of pilots saying that they never have to course correct for the globe and that it's always flat are all those pilot pilots in on some then there's the videos of all the pilots saying that yeah the earth is flat they never have to course correct for the globe it always goes in a straight line are all those pilots part of some wacky conspiracy to get views on the internet? I think it's highly unlikely. And once again, I'd like to remind you, I'm not a flat earther or a globe earther. I think there's a decent amount of evidence to suggest that the earth should be a sphere. But then again, there's also a decent amount of evidence that they've been lying about a bunch of stuff to prop up that theory. My biggest issue is why is it so hard to have this conversation? Why does it have to always get so nasty? Why is flat earth and globe earth right up there with pro-life and pro-choice? We used to be able to just talk about cool stuff and imagine and wonder, and now you got a giant majority of the population who are just bullies that are constantly trying to make fun of you for asking questions. Normal, reasonable, rational questions. And most of them are keyboard warriors that are pretending they have PhDs in astrophysics. 
it's really pathetic. It's pathetic that we are punishing people for having open minds and asking interesting questions and trying to see the world in the truest way possible. Which again, only makes you look guilty as sin, as if you're trying to cover something up. Because if you were confident in what you believed in and you understood what was happening, you just explain it. You just answer the question. And don't get me wrong, it's not everybody being a jerk. At the end of the day, it's about compassion. It's about chilling out and letting people have interesting, strange ideas. If you only understood how many philosophers, scientists, and free thinkers tried to see the world in a new way throughout history and were punished severely, only for us to find out, sometimes centuries later, they were right. You might be a little more lenient when someone asks you a strange and uncomfortable question about something you thought you knew everything about, but the question itself brings into question what you believed. This globe earth never made sense to me. How does water stick to a sphere? Logically thinking, water is not going to stick to this apple. Just like below the ocean, there is land. Just like if I put my finger in this and made a dent and put water in it all over these dents, it's not going to stick to it. Logically thinking, because I'm sure we all know that under the ocean is more land, which is inside. And again, logically thinking, this model would mean that we're on Earth, not in Earth. And every time I think about being on Earth, that would mean people would be on the side of the side, on the side of the bottom, on the very bottom. How does that even make sense? This makes a lot more sense. This would be in Earth. And when you're in Earth, you can walk on a flat surface. And when you're in Earth, water finds its level. Am I the only one that thinks like this? The flat earth map dates back over 1,000 years. This map is credited to being created by a Persian astronomer. His name was al Biruni, and he lived between 973 AD to 1048 AD. It's the official map of the United Nations and also the United States Geological Survey. It used to be present in many places before the creation of NASA and the Antarctic Treaty in 1959. Here you see it with Admiral Byrd. This map has been restored by Dmitri from Russia with suggestions of mine, Idia Lenkar. Known by my YouTube channel Flat Earth Benjo, I asked Dmitri to include the Bermuda Triangle and Point Nemo, a place deep in the Pacific where NASA buries rockets. Then Robert Tazi, a professional mapmaker, came along and enhanced the map even more. There are many people now selling this map online, but if you could order it from my online store, I would greatly appreciate it. Visit my online store now and order one of the items. I humbly thank you.